That means that the church should live in such a way, in an intentional community that lives and breathes and dies for God and for each other and that follows the teachings of Jesus and looks a certain way. And there should be a massive distinction. The churches should live in such a way, right, that the world and the ways of the world are so painfully obvious to anybody that the contrast, again, is so sharp that there's no confusion. And you can read about the early church, not just in the Bible, but in other historical books and historians who talk about the way the early church lived and how distinct and different. And actually it says they were annoying in their love for each other and annoying in their generosity for each other. There should be no mistaking who's who. Uh, we are in now the last two weeks which is really hard to believe, of this Summer on the Mount series that we've been walking through, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is known famously as uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So I have the privilege over these next two weeks of uh, running the anchor leg uh, of the series, which I'm excited about. Now, I want to tell you that as I take the uh, baton, we'll say, uh, from Jordan to run that anchor leg, that these next two weeks uh, are going to be intense, and I'm giving you fair warning now. That's not because uh, Pastor Josh chose them to be intense. Uh, if you look at what Jesus says uh, in the last half of, of Matthew 7, it's fairly serious. Uh, it's fairly intense. And so, um, you know, my job and Pastor Jordan's job is to be as faithful to the text as we possibly can uh, and combine that with what we feel the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. So I just want to give you a heads up on that because Jesus Again, referring to that last half of Matthew 7, as he draws his sermon to a close, he issues a set of warnings uh, that should have uh, a deeply uh, sobering effect on us. Um, and, and if we've been nodding off, for, you know, so to speak, uh, regarding this whole Jesus thing, if we've been pulling one of those, like, you know, type of things in our life, these words should jolt us awake. Uh, these aren't words that we should be able to casually read through uh, and dismiss or ignore or not, not take seriously, you know. I've been preaching now for over 20 years, and I think if you distilled all of my messages that I've preached over those 20 years, and you took them all and distilled them down into one phrase, uh, that phrase would probably be, take Jesus seriously. And I think that's been... Uh, something that God has placed on my life um, and in what I'm to preach since I really uh, became a pastor uh, way long ago, it seems now. Um, take Jesus seriously. Uh, and that means a whole lot of different things. It means take what Jesus said seriously, take what the Bible uh, writers say about Jesus seriously, take about what the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus uh, say seriously, take... Uh, all those things and how they apply to your life seriously. It's not uh, something that's meant to be taken casually. Uh, it's kind of a big deal, if you haven't noticed by now. And so let me tell you up front, that being said, that I'm going to throw a lot at you over the next two weeks. And I'm aware of that as I was prepping it. I did my best to really condense things down. Um, but it's a lot. And, that, and I think that's okay. So with that in mind, let me offer you two pieces of advice how to just think about these messages. The first is don't worry about getting everything all at once. Don't worry about getting everything all at once. The word once, there we go. Hey, there it is. Like, Matt, poof. Um, let there be light. So don't worry about getting everything all at once. If I understand some of this, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, slow down. That's a lot. How do I take this all in? It's okay. Just soak it up today the best you can. Uh, and number two then would be Plan on going back over these messages uh, a time or two, okay? Plan on going back over these messages at least another time or two. Don't uh, assume that you're going to get, because I don't think you're going to get it all at once, don't think that it'll be enough. I would really encourage you highly to listen to these uh, a couple more times. So with that, all that stuff being said, uh, are we ready? Are we ready to kind of dive headfirst into the deep end? So a little dangerous, a little exciting at the same time. So Matthew 7, 15 through 20, says this, Jesus' words. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Very strong language here. By their fruit you will recognize them. 
Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, I've heard this uh, passage preached many times over the years. And the approach I've seen most often employed by pastors when they preach through this text takes on two basic forms. Number one, I think we have this on the screen, they use these verses as a platform or an excuse to publicly lay waste to those that are in a different theological camp than the pastor in his church's particular camp. Does that make sense? So what it means that I've seen is Baptists will shred the Pentecostals, right? The Pentecostals, Jordan can testify to this, will shred other Pentecostals they don't agree with in certain areas. And the Reformed pastors will shred anybody, actually, who's not Reformed. So, and I understand that I kind of just made fun of Reformed pastors after joking about not doing that, but anyway. So, that's the, the tactic that's employed here, is... Let's go after this other denomination that we think is off kilter in some way, shape, or form, and they just get riled up and fired up. This, this tactic, this approach, actually generally includes, in my experience again, and maybe you can relate, maybe not, that's okay, but it, it includes a second sub-tactic is what I would call it. And that's this. While the pastor is in the process of defacing other denominations, he will also go after televangelists, or other public religious figures that are ridiculously easy targets, okay? So not only do they blast another denomination, they will begin to pick on and fill in the blank with the name of the televangelist that you've recognized. These are people that are ridiculously easy targets, right? It doesn't take a genius to figure out that the guy on TV telling everybody that God has told him to get a $450 million private jet, right, is a bit off right? That that probably doesn't fall in line with the sweep of scripture. It just doesn't play out that way. And we could all probably name other things that we look at and it's literally just makes your stomach churn, right? It doesn't take a genius. It doesn't take a brilliant like expositor of scripture or somebody that knows deep stuff to look at that and go, it's nonsense. Like, let's get rid of that. Okay. So those are the approaches they take, blasting other denominations and then blasting people that are easy targets. And I'm, you can think right now, and you can name names, and I'm not going to do that. But so far as I can tell, when they do these things, the end result of this approach that I just laid out is that the vast majority of the congregation, probably all the congregation, walk out of the doors feeling really good about themselves and the way they live their lives. Now, why is that? because they've just experienced a 45-minute echo chamber where everything they already believed about those people out there and about themselves as well has just been reflected back to them. It is the absolute quintessential example of preaching to the choir, right? preaching to the choir, let's blast everybody else, we'll all feel good about ourselves, we'll walk out the door, patting ourselves in the back, knowing that we're right and they're wrong, and it creates a further divide, further separation, whatever. And I suppose I could take that approach this morning. I suppose if I hadn't laid out these two things I just said and took that approach, you may not have been aware, you may not have noticed, and I may have even, you know, gotten some pats on the back. After I preach that way, you may have told me, good job, excellent, good sermon. You know, but in my opinion, for any number of reasons, that would be an absolute total waste of my time and a waste of your time as well. Have you ever watched uh, any, anybody ever watched any old boxing matches? Boxing matches. Uh, and I'm talking like older, you know, like the Muhammad Ali days, if you've seen any tapes of those. And I think some Sugar Ray Leonard, he was one of the guys that did this too. But have you ever seen in these fights 
I don't know who the first one to do this was, and I tried to look it up and just couldn't figure it out, but they're boxing, right? And these are highly skilled dudes, and all of a sudden, one of the guys just starts doing this. You ever seen that? And they're doing it really fast, and then all of a sudden, they punch with the other hand. Anybody ever seen that happen? Right? So the guy gets focused on, what is this dude doing? Why is he swinging his arm really wildly, right? But left arm is just flying, and he gets focused on that, and before he knows it, the right hand just drills him right in the face. That's what I want to talk about together for the remainder of our time. Let me ask you a question. This will be on the screen. What would you do if you were to discover that you'd unknowingly embraced and oriented your life around a belief system that you've always assumed you were adamantly opposed to? It's a big question, friends, and I understand that. What would you do if you were to discover that you'd unknowingly embraced and oriented your life around a belief system that you've always assumed you were adamantly opposed to? It's like, you know, since I was a kid, I've been a Hawkeye fan. But what if all of a sudden I started saying things after Hawkeye games like, well, at least we won the second half. Or if you take away those three touchdowns they scored, we would have won the game. Or that liquid plumber toilet bowl we get to go to this year is actually a much better bowl than people think. If I started saying those things, I would hopefully have the realization, oh my gosh, I'm becoming an Iowa State fan. <laughs> How? <laughs> so I hope that that joke helped to soften the question a bit. But how do you think that you might feel upon a revelation like that, that you have been embracing, not and orienting your life around a belief system that you've always assumed you were opposed to? What would your response be? Is this getting your attention? Let's talk about secularism. Secularism, most of you have heard of, is essentially the idea that we can imagine a world without God the belief in a sort of free moral order that exists apart from the divine order. Now, before we go any further, let me say that secularism is not, it is not necessarily a denial of God's existence. Instead, secularism is the conception of a world without the constant presence of God as a necessary influence on everything. That's an important distinction to make. Secularism is not necessarily a denial of God's existence. It's that we can imagine or conceive of a world that has an order to it and has meaning within it, but it's apart from God. The constant presence of God is not a necessary influence on everything. The created world, again, and it can be created by God, but it's seen as self-sustaining, capable of existing without the presence of the uncreated being, God. Without getting too deep into this massive, it's a massive topic, and there's going to be a bunch of those things today where I could easily go way deeper, and I'll resist that temptation. But without going too deep into just this, let's talk about a few varieties of secularism to help us get some more perspective on this. One variety is called deism. And deism is what many, many of lion's share of the founding fathers of this country embraced. They did not embrace biblical Christianity. They embraced deism. Deism was the belief that while God created the world, he doesn't really interact with it. And I could pull quote after quote after quote from founding fathers that ex explicitly say this exact thing. It's the belief that while God may have created the world and likely did, in their opinion, there is some kind of higher power that's a bit undefined. He doesn't really interact with it. I think it's summed up well by uh, an old Dave Matthews band song. 
where he says, if at all God's gaze upon us falls, it's with a mischievous grin. That's sort of deism. God created the world. He doesn't really interact with it. If he does, it's kind of just to mess with it a little bit. That's number one. Number two is one you may have heard more about. It's called atheistic secularism. This was once a very, very small movement uh, in the West. Most people thought that atheistic secularism was ridiculous. They definitely believed in some sort of divine being or creator, higher power, guy upstairs, however you want to label that. But now it's gaining a lot of steam, thanks to, for a whole bunch of reasons. But there's atheistic secularism. And what this means is that it's not enough to conceive of a world ordered without God, but any mention of him must be removed from the public order. All public policy, therefore, must not only not favor any religion, but it can't be influenced, it by, influenced by it at all. This form of secularism basically has told uh, us religious types, the church, that, you know, the secularists will say, the atheist secularists will say, we will run the world and we'll work towards our secular utopia. And you religious types, you can teach people how to like say some prayers and maybe go to heaven when they die. Right? It's been relegated to that sort of, just sort of dismissive type of attitude. Right? Okay, so we have deism. We have atheistic secularism. Don't want to spend too much time on those. The next one's what we're going to hit. There's a form of secularism, lastly, that compartmentalizes and divides things into spheres. Okay, there's a sphere for God. There's a sphere for common sense. There's a sphere for everyday, ordinary sort of activities. So if I had a graphic and it had a pie chart, you might have work here and sports here and kids here and you know this here and God here is a part of the pie chart right what does God have to do with my grocery shopping or what outfit I wear or the latest Netflix show that I happen to be binge watching you know the logical conclusion and outcome of this way of thinking of this sort of compartmentalization and dividing things into to spheres the logical conclusion of that is that most of life isn't relevant to God. And if most of life isn't relevant to God, follow me here, then it makes complete sense. It, it completely makes sense, and I get it. It makes complete sense to set aside only one small portion of one morning per week for him. That would be now. But let's not make it too long, okay, Pastor? Because after all, I have everyday, ordinary sort of things I need to get to. My kids, they've got sports on Sundays. We've got to make sure we're out by a certain time to get there for those. So don't, let's not talk about it for too long. You know, Tim, don't extend that song, okay? Beyond those couple minutes. Let's just keep things moving, right? We've got this. We've got that. We have obligations to attend to. We have real world stuff. So I'm happy to give, in our case, from 10 to 11.30, but once it's 11.30, once it's 11.25, and you notice Jordan said he has three more points, you're starting to get nervous, right? That's the way it goes, okay? So the compartmentalization, the understanding that God is a part of life, but not all of life, and we have this sort of spheres of things, right? That form of secularism, this third and final secularism, has a name. Here's the name for it. Go ahead and put that on the screen. And that's the name for it. Christianity in the United States. Did I tell you that this is going to be intense? I know that you know that I, you know, usually I just go easy and don't, you know. <laughs> I, I pull a lot of punches, but this is different, and I get that. This is, this is what I think this is the majority of Christianity in the United States. The idea that God would be an ordinary part of life, like that it's, that it's, God is, it's day in, day out, 24-7, 365, or even that life itself would be fully immersed 
in the divine presence, like the idea that from our wake till we wake till we sleep, we're thinking about it, consumed by God and focused on God and reorienting ourselves towards God. And every decision we make, I understand there are some basic things, but a lot of decisions we make, we're always consulting with God through prayer and consulting with Christian brothers and sisters for advice. The idea of these things, right? These are not the norm for most people. Even for us religious people, even for us Christians, these are not the norm. Is it not true that nowadays most people in the West consider their own reason, their own judgment, their own wisdom to be the primary ruler of their lives? I think that's absolutely true. Now, the irony, of course, is they may not be very reasonable or very logical or have much wisdom. But, of course, the perceptions and decisions of their own minds are what govern their day-to-day -day living. Most of us, if we're being reflective this morning, which is what I'm asking you to do, and challenge yourself and be challenged, allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you, most of us probably function this way most of the time. I can't tell you how many times in the past 20 years as a pastor that I've had somebody come to me after the fact, and I know Pastor Jordan can relate to this, after the fact, and they made some monster decision that's gone completely awry. They never consulted anybody. They didn't consult the pastors. They didn't consult godly friends. Why? Well, why would, why would we do that? And I get it, because we're products of the age that we live in. Additionally, most of us would not claim that we have an absolute sense of, of the presence of God here, and we're in church at this very moment. We feel, and we've been taught this, but we feel as though we must go looking for him, as though we must do something special to bring him here. That's why we come to church. It's for an experience or something supernatural in the midst of what we consider to be otherwise natural lives. In the West, our default way of functioning is as though God is absent. And most of the time, we don't feel his absence. That is, we don't miss him. So you may walk through however many, 90% of your waking hours or more without even thinking about God, and you may not even be aware that you haven't. You may not even notice that you're hungry or that you should be hungry or that you're not. Peter Kraft, the theologian, says this, and this is a strong statement. He says, most theists, those would be people like us, most theists are deists most of the time in practice, if not in theory. So we may acknowledge that we are theists, so we believe in the one God, creator God. But in practice, we act like deists. They practice the absence of God instead of the presence of God. This fact, you're agreeing with me to this point, but this fact is yet another way of revealing something that is highly concerning and I think very noticeable, and it's this, that any sharp contrast between Orthodox Christianity and the Western secular culture has almost completely collapsed. There should be, <laughs> there should be no mistaking who's who between those who follow Jesus and those who follow the world. There should be no mistaking who's who. But we ourselves have become secular. We have to essentially force ourselves to have a sense of God's presence and influence. Stanley Hauerwas, the theologian, said, the job of the church is not to make the world more like the church. The job of the church is to make the world more like the world. Now, what does that mean? That means that the church should live in such a way, in an intentional community that lives and breathes and dies for God and for each other, and that follows the teachings of Jesus and looks a certain way, and there should be a massive distinction the churches should live in such a way, right, that the world and the ways of the world are so painfully obvious to anybody that the contrast, again, is so sharp. 
that there's no confusion. And you can read about the early church, not just in the Bible, but in other historical books and historians who talk about the way the early church lived and how distinct and different. And actually it says they were annoying in their love for each other and annoying in their generosity for each other. There's some crazy stuff that these secular theologians wrote, or not theologians, secular historians wrote back then. There should be no mistaking who's who. But we, we've been so sucked into our secular culture and our secular way of thinking. But if I asked you, do you live a secular life? You would probably absolutely, re- no, you'd recoil against the very thought of that. You wouldn't like me insinuating that. You wouldn't want me to say that to you. I wouldn't want you to say it to me, but if I, we begin to really talk about what your life looks like on a daily basis, how often are you aware of the presence of God? How often are you putting things in front of you in an intentional way to make sure you're not forgetting about the presence of God? When you have a decision to make, what is your approach? What is your three-step approach? Is it just you thinking about how you want to do things? Or are you thinking further down the line and how it might affect others, how it might affect your church community? Are you going to go talk to Pastor Jordan, to myself, to a group of us to get advice? How is this stuff functioning? Are you looking and comparing yourself uh, and your life against the Gospels and against the New Testament and analyzing it from that perspective instead of saying that you're different simply because you have a different intellectual assent to a different set of ideas. But they don't necessarily play out or affect your life in different ways. This is a very real struggle for me at times. All right, So I'm preaching to myself this morning on some level as much as I am to any of you. I can go, it seems like at times, hours and get caught up in my day and have certain mindsets enter in that are very not Jesus, right? But if it's a struggle for me, I imagine it may be for you too, and that it's a struggle at all for any of us is an indication of how deep-seated this mindset is in us. The person who has a constant sense of God's presence with him or her and wakes up every morning, and the first thing is what Jordan said in communion, your will be done today in my life. Guide me, direct me, take me through, keep me from the temptations of this world. Don't let me be indoctrinated by the secular culture and mindset. But that's a rarity, that person, where it should be the norm. Let's get more specific. If this hasn't already been intense or nerdy enough for you, here, get ready for this part going to get a little, a little heady for a minute, but it's worth it. Let me get more specific than I've been, because this has been a bit maybe abstract, but let me get more specific about the secularist disease that's infected the Western church. The secularism that most Americans believe in, when I said this form of secularism has a name and it's Christianity in the United States, there's actually a name that goes beyond that. It's actually a form of religion that's been identified And here's what it's called. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Okay? You can just call it MTD for short. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. This is a term that was invented by a couple of sociologists named Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist. They wrote a book in 2005 called Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of America's Teenagers. And they coined this term, moralistic therapeutic deism, to describe the belief system of American teenagers that they encountered in 2005 in doing tons of research for this book. And although Smith and Denton were talking about teenagers 15 years ago, their description of moralistic therapeutic deism is completely and totally apt for most Americans these days of whatever age and whatever specific religious affiliation. My experience uh, with even Bible-believing Christians over the past 20 years, that they largely function in these terms that I'm going to lay out. So what does it entail exactly? They identified five teachings of this worldview. Let's walk through them. Five teachings of this secularist view, moralistic, therapeutic deism. Number one, a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Pretty straightforward. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, 
and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. <clears throat> Keeps getting more interesting. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to solve a problem. Okay, again, this is a ton of research they did with teenagers in 2005. These were the things that all these teenagers said. This is what they believe. God doesn't really need to be involved. Yep, he created it, watches over it, but he doesn't really need to be around unless I'm in, uh, in some serious trouble, right? God, if you get me out of this, I swear that I will never, <laughs> right? What's the old saying? There's no atheist in foxholes, right? Something along those lines probably here. The last one is this. Good people go to heaven when they die, okay? And that's it. That's the secular mindset of most Americans, including most American Christians. God is definitely out there. Yep, don't believe in uh, Darwinian philosophy, Darwinian mechanics, evolution. God is out there. He created the world. I don't know what it looked like, but he did it. He definitely, I know this, he wants us to be good now. How do we define that exactly? I think we've seen some problems with that recently here. <laughs> what good looks like. But, you know, he's out there, wants us to be good, but... The point of life is to be happy, and God doesn't come into the picture unless there's a problem. And if you are good, again, how do you measure that exactly? Then you get to go to heaven when you die. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? Now, here's where it is going to get a little more touchy. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> after I'd already written this message, and I was questioning, is this a little too intense? Am I off here. I feel like I'm on, but, you know, I, I happened to read uh, a big study after this was already done. It came out, and I was like, the timing on this is crazy. So, huge Christian research group. Some of you probably heard of them called, called the Barna Group. They did a, a very comprehensive um, set of research interviewing thousands of Americans asking them questions regarding uh, their religious beliefs. So what they found is that nearly two-thirds of Americans, right at 66%, believe that having some kind of faith is more important than having any particular faith, right? So the classic, all roads lead to the same place, right? Different roads, same destination, same end, same end game, right? Now, so think about, I want you to think about this. I'm a numbers person, and I'll give you some numbers in a minute, but I want you to think about this. Two-thirds, okay, of the people, of just general American population that they interviewed said, any religious affiliation doesn't really matter. It's good. That's more important, okay? Two-thirds of the people answered that way. Of the two-thirds of the people, of the 66% of people who set, made that statement, doesn't matter what faith, 68% of those people identified as Christians, 68% of those people identified as Christians. Does that give you pause? And then they, and I don't have these stats up, up here today, but then they broke it down by denomination. So 68% of the 66%. And then it wasn't like these people, and they were like evangelical Christians, Pentecostals, mainline. And it was all the same. Jordan and I talked about this this week. It was all the same. There was no, like, wild variance within de across denominations. 68% of people that self-identified as Christian said there's many ways to heaven. Now, here's what that looks like, okay? Here's some math for you. We could put that up. So let's imagine there were 1,000 people surveyed. There were more than that, but let's just use this to keep it simple. 66% disturbing number that you end up with. <laughs> I don't think I wasn't, didn't notice that, but uh, so just, I just went with it, you know? So, so you have 666 people that said, you know, whatever, it's all good. Have some faith, doesn't matter which. 68% of those people were Christians. 
So that means you have 450 out of 1,000, right? Those are people who are identifying as Christians who believe that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you have a faith in something. That equals 45%, right? 450 out of 1,000 is 45%. We have 200 people in this church, adults, give or take. If everybody's here, if these statistics hold true for us, I'm just saying maybe they don't, maybe they, I don't know. But if you take 45% of 200, that means we have 90 people who call this their church home, who attend on a regular basis, who sit hopefully in these pews and listen to us teach uh, about the exclusivity of the gospel and Jesus and all these things. And there's 90 people, that's darn close to half, who actually are not getting it. That's, that's, I don't say that because it gives me joy. It's, I say that because it scares me. Because it's concerning for me to think that up to half of, and I'm not going to speak for other churches because I don't pastor those churches, so I don't know. All I know is that just that thing is scary. And it's worth mentioning. And it's worth addressing, and it's worth making sure <laughs> that we're not doing that. And that if you identified earlier with all those beliefs, and that's where you land, that you know that's not what we believe. 90, 45% of our church potentially. And then, to break it down one step further, of the 45% of the, um, or the, I'm sorry, of the 68% of the people that responded that way that were Christians, over half of them stated explicitly they felt like you could attain salvation just simply by doing good. So there are, that's the 45 people. So that means there would be 22.5% of this church would think that there's just, you can just be good and you get to heaven. It, honestly, it, it it's a, it's a big concern for me. I have been aware of this. I have felt this for many, many years. And, and, but seeing this study just like put a, and I'm not always big into studies like that, but I, the way they did it was pretty good. So here's the question, what makes it possible for people who actually belong to churches, Bible-believing, gospel-centered churches? What makes it possible for people who actually belong to churches to believe and function according to this mindset? How can, you, how can that happen? I don't get it. It frustrates me to no end. But at least part of the reason is that it's teachings. They can be called that because there's no real specific teacher. Right? There's nobody who says, we have a moralistic, therapeutic, deist church. <laughs> right? But they're roughly similar to many religions, ethics, and general understanding of creation. So if you have these sort of beliefs that are real sort of just nebulous and you hold on to them and you hear other people say similar stuff, it's not pushing against you. And you might even hear us say certain things and it might even in your mind reinforce something you believe because you might be like, well, I don't agree with that part, but I do think this is... And so it, it just doesn't get challenged so directly, Right? What did I talk about earlier? About the left hand swinging wildly while you're getting drilled with the right hand. Because we're focused so often on, oh, the radical left, the liberal culture. They're doing all this terrible stuff and it's horrible and they're trying to, and I'm not disagreeing with you necessarily. Right? Agree. Guess what? That's the world. The world's gonna be the world. Right? I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying I agree with it. The world is going to be the world. That's the left hand, in my opinion, swinging wildly. The right hand drilling us in the face if we're not careful is all the subtleties that go along with that. All the subtleties. The enemy is not stupid. He's been doing this for a long time. The left hand swinging wildly is pretty obvious. He wants to sneak in the rights. The way he wants to sneak in the right hand and hit you with it over and over again is to just get your focus off. To think that, well, I'm good or I'm doing this better than somebody else. or I, and that, and that, It doesn't take long before we're, we're a mess 
That's the problem with moralistic therapeutic deism, to keep repeating that odd phrase, but it's how vague it is. It believes in a God, a God. And this God is one who wants us to be good. Again, there's no definition here. And, and if we are this God, whatever he or she or it or whatever it is, then we will go to heaven, and there's no definition of heaven when we die. It's all very general, all very uneducated, all very nonspecific. Here's the rub, and here's where we're coming to the end. Okay? True Christians, true Christians, and yes, I said it, true Christians, okay, do not believe in some vague God. We believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm helping you out here. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? If you found yourself identifying today with the MTD, I don't want you to feel condemned. I want you to feel like you have a chance right now to wake up, to snap out of it. It's not some vague God we believe in. We believe in the very specific God, the God of Scripture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the incarnation that is the enfleshing of God himself via the person of Jesus Christ. And we believe all that goes along with that, right? Which is part of the Apostles' Creed, but that there was, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He was crucified on our behalf, resurrected, triumphing over sin and death and the grave. And he will return at some point to judge the living and the dead. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the only and one judge. There are not other judges, right? There are not multiple ways. It is Jesus, one and only, God incarnate. And that everything he said is true. We believe it. We believe his claim is to exclusivity. That we don't try to take it and leave it in certain spots. But that we believe it's, it's a big deal. It's Jesus, okay? It's not Jesus and, or, yeah, Jesus was this or that. No, it's, it's, that's it. That's the whole ball of wax. Everything we know about this specific God that we believe in is revealed through Jesus. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't know a whole heck of a lot. So it's a good thing that we did, and that's what we cling to. Next, we believe that life is not merely about being, quote, unquote, good. What, again, what does that even mean? Or, not, or only about a specific set of ethics. But it's about cooperating with the Holy Spirit so that we might become more like Jesus. Trying to be good, whatever that means, on your own, good luck with that. What we believe is that, yes, we are supposed to be good people. We are supposed to adhere to the ethics of Jesus, which he's laid out here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But the only way that's possible, the only way to do that, and how we're guided into those things, how we're empowered to do that, is through the Holy Spirit, who we're told is constantly conforming us into the image and likeness of Jesus. We're not doing good on our own so that we can somehow measure up to some abstract standard that nobody actually knows, so that we can hopefully get into this place called heaven that we don't even know what it's like. No, we are being transformed into the image and the likeness of a very specific person who actually lived, who was actually God incarnate. We're being shaped into that form by God himself to achieve a certain point in time where we stand before our Father, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. The Christian life is not vague. It's not abstract. It's not just this thing, I, oh, I believe in all the things I've talked about thus far. Next, we believe that life isn't about the pursuit of happiness. Sorry, Will Smith, right? We believe that life isn't about the pursuit of happiness or self-actualization, which is self-realization, you know, upward mobility, but the pursuit of holiness, and self-destruction, and you're like, self-destruction, that's strong language. Yes, it is. Holiness, first of all, for the record, means that we are pursuing uh, to be nearer to God, to be more God-like, and to be set apart from this world. That is the call of holiness, to be called out, to be set apart, to be different, to be distinct, like I mentioned earlier, to be easily identifiable, the city set on the hill that can't be hidden, right? 
all the metaphors that Scripture uses about what the Christian and the Christian community is supposed to look like. We're pursuing that, that set apart, self-destruction. John the Baptist said it best, I must become less. He must become greater. It's not about you stepping into some weird version of your true self where you're looking internally and trying to figure it all out. It's about you laying all that down at the foot of the cross and saying, I've been crucified with Christ. I don't, I don't longer live my happiness, my pleasure, all these things that I think I need to get from me, I lay those down for the sake of something better. Because Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. So I'm all about self-destruction. Come and destroy the me in me. It's still there, it's still holding on. The parts of me that haven't yet, right, been sanctified. That's the process that I'm in. I don't want to become the best me the best me was destined for hell on my own. I want to become the best Christ in me, the hope of glory. These are major contrasts. Last two, we believe that God isn't distant or callous or even, quote unquote, a part of our lives, but is always, always present with us and that we're to be in constant communion with him. that God is not a piece of the pie, he's the entire pie. He's the whole enchilada. He's everything. In him we live and move and have our being. That we, I remember when um, Boz, right, was here. Remember when he was here? That was awesome. One of the things he said that I thought was so profound that it stuck with me ever since, it was one of the things that he prayed, just that my breath, God, is your breath. Like, I literally wake up in the morning and still remember that. Just the fact that I even breathe right now, this is your breath. You breathe life into me. I have literally nothing apart from you. You're not a part of my life. You, you are my life. Without you, I have nothing, no hope. And because of that, we're told, too, to abide, remain in him, constant communion with him. And this is maybe one of, if, of the sharpest contrasts between the Christian life. Not that there are others aren't equally or very important, but this is one of the sharpest ones in terms of how the Christian walk should look. It's not just a part of our lives. It's everything, guys. It's everything. And finally, we don't believe in heaven as a vague, good place, reward for the ethical we believe in an eternal union with the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, a union that can last and deepen and become more intimate and powerful for all of eternity. And you think when you get to heaven, you're going to be able to take all of God in at once? It's going to take a long time. I hope, heck, I hope that my house is big enough that it takes me a long time just to explore all the rooms. That's not something that's, that's not a, uh, when the Bible tells us to store up treasure in heaven, it's eternal. It's okay to think that way. We believe that there's a very specific heaven that's been set aside for a very specific group of people who will believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and they will remain faithful until the end. That they won't give up. That they won't back down that they'll devote their lives to him. And that it, it's not, again, this, this vague place, but the whole city itself, the new Jerusalem that comes down, it's illuminated with the holiness and the presence of God and that will glory in that for all of eternity. And that thing right there is our hope. Is our hope. One of my favorite poets says, I love it. It's a bit sad, but I still love the profundity of it. He says, if there was no way into God, I would never have laid in this grave of a body for so long. <laughs> His whole point is, this life is a bit of a struggle, if you haven't noticed at times. If there was no hope in eternity in God, if there was no way to be in eternal communion with God, I would have been done. So here's my question for you. Where are you at with this? Don't look to the outside, to the culture, the people you might know or you're thinking about right now, like, yeah, that person, really. And that may have come up, that's fine. 
Where are you at with this right now? Where are you at? Do you feel like you've been watching the left hand swinging? And you've been getting drilled by the right hand? That you've taken some hits, that you're a little bit bloody, a little bit bruised? Can you ask yourself honestly this morning, you lean into that MTD camp, you have kind of these abstract set of beliefs about being a good person and there's some God and you just happen to worship in the, this church. Are you a moralistic, therapeutic deist who's compartmentalized God, put him as a part of your life, or are you a Jesus follower? Are you somebody who's pushed all your chips to the center and said, I'm all in? I'm all in. I know I'll have my days. I know I'll have my moments. I might even have my weeks where it's not feeling so good. It's not going so well, but I am committed to drawing myself and allowing myself to be drawn back in. I'm all in. I don't ever want to let go. I don't want to fall by the wayside. I don't want to conform to the patterns of this culture. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Where are you at? And maybe lastly, what are you passing on to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, to those around you? What do they know about you in terms of what you believe very specifically? Peter says, be ready at all times to give an answer to those who ask about the hope, the reason for the hope you have, and to do so with gentleness and kindness. Do you have an answer for them? Do they see, first of all, a difference in you and a hope that you have that's a bit different than what they have? Do they see a difference in your behavior and your attitudes and your actions and your approach to how you live your life? And if they ask you about it, are you ready to give an answer? Are you able to say, well, see, I believe in this guy named Jesus, and actually he was God that came down. I know it sounds a little crazy, but here's all these prophecies, and here all, are you able to at least give some sort of coherent thing? Where are you at with this? Next week, Jesus talks about the wide road and the narrow road. So it's not going to get any easier next week. Well, this is serious stuff. Our job, Jordan and I, job we're told biblically is to deliver you fully mature to Jesus. And this is part of that. We don't want anyone to fall through the cracks. If you feel like you're struggling with this, there is no shame. There is no condemnation. There's no anything. Talk to us, though, please. Don't walk out the doors and, and never come back. Or don't walk the doors and just, like, let it go when you're out the other. Let us know. Let's talk about it. Let's engage. Sound good? All right, let me pray. Father, thank you for who you are, you are the creator God that existed before time in ways that we can't even comprehend. Thank you that you are eternal, that your rule, your reign, Jesus will never end. Thank you that we don't have to have anxiety about trying to figure out how to be good or how to do enough or wondering if we've got it right, but yet we can cling to you, we can trust in you, we can lean on you, that your promises are faithful Help us as a church, let there be nobody in this church that falls outside of Jesus. Let there be nobody who hasn't said, Jesus, you are my all in all, I give you everything. Let nobody fall by the wayside. Let nobody be dragged away by the wolves of this culture. Let nobody be hit repeatedly by that right hand. Let nobody be subtly pulled down into secularism and to this idea that God is just a chunk of our lives. Let every single person in this church be completely taken over by the Holy Spirit and drawn in and conformed to the image of likeness of Jesus. Let our church be conformed to that same likeness. Let there be a dramatic, obvious distinction between the way this church, New Point Church, looks and functions and feels and operates. Let us be that much different than the world and the way the world does things. 
Jesus, we give you the praise for your sacrifice. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for bearing with me today. Love you guys, and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a good rest of the day.